بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله dear brothers and sisters and respected guests I don't usually tell my journey to Islam in fact I've never told my story how I became a Muslim and um, I'm not going to change that today <laughs> so I'm not going to go into great detail uh, concerning my journey to Islam and there's a couple of reasons behind that I wasn't born into a Muslim family. I had 18 years of living my life of uh, being a Catholic. And then I came across Islam. And I sincerely believe, and I know for sure, that especially in the times that we are living in, that every single one of you will have that opportunity to know and find about Islam. You will have that choice. Even if it means that Islam has been presented to you in the most evil way. In the worst possible manner, Islam has been shown to you. However, that you will have that opportunity to really look objectively about that what has been given to you. And not just simply be one of those people who just is maneuvered, controlled, by that what they hear all the time. It doesn't question anything. But rather you're a person from time to time that you do question, that you do ask, you do like to investigate. You give yourself that credit at least. That the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he's been portrayed in these caricatures, in these cartoons. Wait a minute. Why are these people going crazy about it? Why are these people, the Muslims that is, why are they reacting so emotionally? And at times, why are they reacting so violently? Why? What makes them feel so much towards this particular person? This is a question that may pop into your mind for a few seconds. You may investigate it, you may not. Nonetheless, a time came to you when you had that opportunity to really look what is Islam? And even if you are a Muslim, if what you see in the caricatures and the cartoons that are drawn about the Prophet Muhammad, peace, upon him, peace be upon him, how do you feel? Or do you simply say, you know, cartoons, it's not really, it's not my thing. It's really, people want to go ahead and do that, that's fine. Put that in perspective, that somebody draws cartoons of your mother, for example, humiliating her, dishonoring her. How would you feel? You'd feel real, you know, you'd, I, do, I can't imagine how one would feel if five million copies of a magazine were to be produced with your mother on the front of that magazine in all kinds of, you know, poses and, and pictures. So as a Muslim, if you see that and you don't really feel too much, then maybe you need to question yourself or ask yourself, what is my relationship with my Lord and how do I feel towards the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, when I first came across Islam, let's say 21 years ago, I didn't really know what Islam was. I didn't really know who Muslims were. You could have, you could have said to me, and I would have accepted it. Muslims are one thing and Islam is another. I would have accepted that. I even had some of my friends when I was growing up that they were Muslims. They had Pakistani background. But for whatever reason, you know, religion was never spoken about. But... When I came across somebody, when I came across somebody when I was at college, and that he used to pray every day, I was amazed at somebody's devotion and dedication of praying every day. I myself, I lived 30 seconds from an enormous Catholic church. Going on a Sunday was, I mean, it was just too much for me. Maybe I wasn't convinced about the teaching. I mean, it could be many reasons. But I was, I was impressed the fact that a person would pray every day. And then when he said to me, because he used to go away at lunchtime for half an hour, we used to have an hour break and we used to only spend half an hour together. I said, what do you do for that half an hour? He said, well, I pray. I said, well, wow, you pray every day? He said, well, actually, I pray five times a day. I said, I have to see what this person does. Five times a day? I mean, you don't miss one little prayer? You know, when nobody's around, you miss one prayer? He said, no, I pray five times a day. And he said, you, know, you can come have a look. We'll show you how to pray. Or you can see how we pray. And it goes back to the example of Sheikh Abdul Rahim, that the individual who stayed in the masjid, who stayed in the mosque, 
and had the ability to see how the Muslims, how they behaved in the mosque from one day to the next. That each one of us, we all live by a system, we all follow a system. We believe that system to be right, don't we? That what I'm following, or that what I am, that what I stand for, I believe that to be right. I believe that to be the right thing to do. But do you actually ask yourself those questions? Or do you just simply live from one day to the next? This is the society I was brought up in. This is what we are. This is what we do. These are the values that I have. I'm told they're superior. I'm told they're barbaric. And I'm told that they're backward. Is that really the case? Is that the reality? So when I saw the Muslims, how they were praying, unified, the way that they prayed, there was a spark. There was something in me. And I grew up and I always believed in a creator. And I used to like religion. I used to watch, you know, at uh, particular times of the year, seasonal films. Whether it was Jesus of Nazareth around Easter time, or King of Kings, or the Ten Commandments. I, mean, I used to like those kind of religious films without really being a practicing Christian. Even when I was at uh, secondary school, at the back of the class, they used to have uh, uh, the, the Gospels split up into different you know, books. I mean, there was a yellow one, there was an orange one, there was a red one, there was a blue one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I used to be at the back of the class, I used to open, I wanted to take them home. I don't know why, but I used to look through it, some pictures in it, some small you know, stories and parables in it. I used to like it, it was quite interesting. So I had something within me that I used to like religion. I believe it had some, uh, some importance in my life. Because before at the, you know, the current generation that we're living in at the moment, that's what mankind believed in. Mankind believed in a religion. They believed in a creator. And if you look in the Qur'an, the discourse of the Qur'an, it addresses mankind that they believe in a creator. And there are many times that Allah says in the Qur'an that if you were to ask the polytheist Meccans, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, who is the one who gives life and the one who takes away life? Those polytheists, they'll all answer Allah. So the man mankind is addressed in the Qur'an that they are believers in a creator. Throughout history, only of late, one or two generations, that secularism has taken a you know, stronghold in society. Atheism is, if, if, if you like. These people were seen as crazy people. Not long ago, just a couple of generations ago. To claim that you're, you know, we don't believe in God, we believe in these kind of theories. You were seen as something that, you know, a sideshow. It's only that, due to whatever factors that are in place, you know, the, the world is a global village now and ideas can spread quickly, governments or whatever the case may be, I'm not getting involved in that, that these kind of ideas have taken some form of stand within our society. But by and large, humankind is a believing creation and that's who we are. Let's not pretend that we're not something else. We are. We were created, we were put on this earth as a creation that recognizes a creator. Even the most staunch atheist, the most staunch atheist, that he has a most, the, one of the most beloved people to him, laying on a hospital bed with tubes coming out of their mouth and their nose. Don't tell me that something doesn't pass in his mind that if there is a God, save that person. Don't tell me that. Because I am sure. Because that's how we were created. That something, even though they're in denial, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, who said, Ana rabbukum al -a I am the highest God. And he said to Moses, at the time when the waves were about to drown him, he was about to say, I believe in Allah. That he within himself denied, he tried to deny, but certainty was there in his heart. So when you come across things in your life which, when you start asking yourself questions, what, what am I, what am I doing, 
what am I following or what am I living? Is it, is it really the right thing to do? Because we live in a society where you're free to choose. You're free to speak. You know, you, there are many things that you can do. This worldly life, whether an atheist or a Muslim or Christian, you get one go at it. You don't get two goes at it. We all believe that. You get one go at this life. There's no coming back again. So when you have this life, you want to ensure, make sure that it's the, you make the best go of it. Make sure that you have the best opportunity that you can live the best possible life. Because the Christian, the Muslim, the Buddhist, the atheist, the secularist, all the isms and ists you want to mention, every single one of them wants to be happy. They're all looking to be happy. They want to be happy in some way. And some of us, why should we satisfy, satisfy ourselves with just being just mediocre happy? If there's somebody that's happier than me, what makes them happier than me? I want to be part of that. I want to understand why they're really happy. Is happiness found in worldly, you know, phones, cars, things that you can, you know, uh, bring about, pay for? Is that what makes you happy? Or is it something just, I just remember something. Uh, there's a documentary that I saw maybe two or three years ago. And it, it just reminds me about really what's, what is happiness. That there was, um, I think she was a, a trainee nurse or something from this country. And she went over to a small village in Africa. And she came across a really poor family. Something similar maybe you find that in Pakistan. They were really poor. They didn't have much. For the first 24 hours when she saw those people, she couldn't stop crying. She couldn't stop crying because of the difficulties that this woman and her children that they were going through. She was the plan was to stay with her for about three or four, five days or so. By the end of the trip, the woman was still crying. But the reason that she was crying is not the reason that she was crying when she first arrived. She was crying because she was looking at her own life. Because she saw that this woman and this family and her children, they didn't have very much. Didn't have very much in the worldly sense. But you know what? They were so happy. And that they were satisfied. And that here is that she was in one of the main Western world countries. Free to seek and be whatever she liked. But then she started to think about boyfriend problems. Money problems. Study problems. Debt problem. The problems, the list was so long. And she said, you know what, when I came here, I was crying because I thought that she was the unfortunate one. Do you know who the unfortunate one is? I'm the unfortunate one. Because I don't have a satisfaction and I don't have really a purpose in life. This woman doesn't have very much. But you know what, she and her children, they are more happy than I can ever imagine. So worldly, this worldly life that we see in front of us is not a permanent cause for you to be happy. It is a temporary cause that may last one minute, may last an hour, may last a very short time. Whatever it is, is going to last. When I saw that this is what Islam taught, and that the real life is the life of the hereafter. Not that mean that we forsake this life, no, because you try your best for this, in this life. But it's the hereafter that you truly seek. That we have been given the greatest gift the greatest blessing that can be given to anyone. And that is Islam. Because that's why I was created. That's why I'm put here on this earth. To respect and worship God Almighty. To give the rights that are due to every human being. This is what Islam stands for. And it's quite frustrating, personally at least, that when I see other people, they say, this is what Islam is. And I say, that's not Islam. And then it gets all watered down, say, well, that's your version of Islam, and that's my version of Islam, and that's their version of Islam, and then we've got 15 versions of Islam. No. We have one version of Islam, is one Islam. What the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, what he came with, that's Islam. Not for people to start cutting and pasting, taking little bits and say, this is what Islam is. You know, we don't believe in that. Let's hide that away. 
We don't accept that. Hold on. What's going on here? It is of the utmost importance for Muslims not to restrict themselves to small communities, but rather to engage with as many people as they can. To let them know what Islam is. How did I find out what Islam was? Because somebody sat down and said, well, I'm going to start preaching to you now. Listen to me. You know the 18 years that you spent on this earth? It's a waste. It's all gone. You, know, you need to follow this. And if you don't follow this, you're going to go hellfire. Was that said to me? No, it was not. What was said to me was nothing, actually. What I saw were the actions of somebody. That somebody was dedicated in praying. Because I saw that from their actions. And then when I started to study Islam, when I started to read the Quran for myself, because there are many pieces of books, it's in the Quran, it's in the Quran, you know, <laughs> it was quite funny actually, that just a few days ago, somebody said, well, it doesn't say in the Quran that, you know, you can't make any cartoon caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad, that's not in your Quran. And then somebody replied to him and said, oh wow, you know, scholar, could you please teach us, you know, the, the, the rulings of the prayer for the traveler, you know. The person really doesn't know anything about Islam, but here it is quoting Islam, is some form of authority on Islam. Why, for, for as Muslims, we should allow, I mean, they have the right to say that, that's fine. I mean, of course, it in the Quran. It doesn't say, you can't make caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But why don't we as Muslims take the step forward above everybody else and allow us to explain, this is what Islam is. Of course that there are going to be certain individuals, certain people who take parts and interpret it their own way and cause corruption upon earth. That's going to happen. But the point is, and what I saw in Islam, and again, it's something very personal to me, and I guess I'm not the only one. It's not personal to me, but I'm, I'm sure that everybody would recognize that. Is the fairness and the justice that you find in Islam. There was once upon a time that I wanted to uh, join the RAF. And I wanted to join the Royal Air Force because, for a number of reasons, I wanted to be a pilot, and I saw it as a way of life which had a very strict regime. I liked, I liked things to be on time and in their place. I used to like that very much. I'm not always the best at adhering to times and so on and so forth. I mean, of course, we will have our faults. But that's what I like. And when I came across Islam, that's exactly what I found. From the you know, timings of the prayer, the control of one's lusts and desires when you fast, you withhold when your body craves food and drink, you're going to fill your stomach. No, there's a time when I have control over my own self. There's a time when I have wealth, but I know that there are people who are more in need than me so therefore, I part with some of that wealth. About control of myself. And being fair to every single person who's around me. That's what I like. I used to really, it used to really bother me. A number of years ago, I used to be a school teacher. When one of the children would take away just the rubber of another child without permission. That used to really bother me. That's not yours to take. You should ask. You should have you to take permission. These things that I found in Islam from the smallest thing to the biggest thing, to give everything its right, to give everything its place, not to just do things unplanned. Things should be planned, worked towards. You know, when you think about Spain in Europe, and that's something, I mean, of course, we don't have time to talk about, but go look at Spain, you know, seven, eight hundred years of Islamic rule, when the rest of Europe was living through the the Dark Ages. I mean, I didn't call it the Dark Ages. They themselves call it the Dark Ages. Wasn't much really going on. There was infighting between tribes, even within England. But Islam and the Muslims in Spain were flourishing. In the in Europe, right there. What, what, how come they were flourishing? Everybody else was, you know, in the Dark Ages. What happened there? What were they doing? And then, likewise, continue with the history. Why did it fall down? Because you don't find an Islamic empire in Spain now. You can see what it left in terms of the, the buildings and the masajid and some of the, you know, and even some in the language, you can find that. 
But why did it fall? Why did it fall? Because of whether there are many factors, many reasons, I'm not a historian, but some of those things, because of their internal squabbling, the gear towards prioritizing certain people at certain times, there was the prioritizing of this worldly life or the hereafter. They forsake what was going to happen in the hereafter. So they became weak and they lost their way. And it was an empire that was lost at that one particular time. And if you look at other empires that existed before that, why is it that these empires, these civilizations, that they fell down? Because they sought to live and die for this world, essentially. The Roman Empire, and then eventually being split into the East, the Byzantine and the Western. Why did it fall? Because it became weak, because that what it sought was the pleasures and the treasures of this world. And if you do that, that will cease to exist at one time when you will realize that there's only so much motivation in seeking something from this life. If I pluck out, because I've mentioned a number of, if you like, some messages throughout my time I've had with you. And that is to really for yourself, Muslim, Christian, Jew, what you're doing, what you're following, what do you stand for? Do you want to be just one of those who just is one of the one of the moj, one of the wave that comes in and comes out? Or do you want to be a somebody not out of arrogance, not out of pride, that you give value to yourself. You give value to who you are and what you stand for. And there are many famous statements concerning this, that if you don't stand for anything, something along those lines, if you don't believe in anything, you'll fall for anything. You should stand for something, you should believe in something. Something that is of benefit to you, to your families, to your neighbors, to mankind. And I think, and as a Muslim, and if you speak as a Muslim, and this is something we should always speak about to ourselves, that this gift that Allah gave to us, you should share it with other people. Share it with other people. Because it is the best kept secret that exists on this earth to more than four-fifths of this earth. Four-fifths of this earth don't know what they are missing. Don't know what Islam is. What they know of Islam is ISIS. Or people walking around the streets with guns. That's far from what Islam is. And what was mentioned earlier, talking about the beauty of the Qur'an, the beauty of who the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was, you'll find that there was a big difference, a big contrast between the two. But it is up to us. Either I can just, I heard it, and then I just moved on. And maybe I'll look back in my life. Maybe I'll look back and I'll say, you know what, I had an opportunity really to take things, but I didn't. And there was a time when, and I'm a Muslim, that I was reminded about the importance of this gift that was given to me, Al-Islam. And I decided to really dedicate myself to becoming a better Muslim, a better human being. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a gathering which serves as a life changing, not because of me, because I'm invoking God Almighty, I'm invoking Allah. That he makes this time that we've had together a time that I can look back, if I have whatever, how many years I have, you know, look back on my life. That this was a time that there was a change in my life and that I became a better person. I became a better human being. Maybe I became, I became a better Muslim. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable that day to be this day. Ameen. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah bless you all. Guide us all to the straight path. Thank you for the, your patience and sitting and listening to me. Go on. Jazakum Allah khair. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.